Welcome to Get Connected uh, with the Alabama School Connection. Uh, my name is Tricia Crane. I'm the Executive Director of the Alabama School Connection, which is a K-12 website uh, that shares news about information about uh, public education in Alabama. Today, we're going to talk with Susan Ellis, who is the State Coordinator for People First. Um, Susan is going to talk to us about a difficult subject for a lot of families uh, who have children with disabilities or children with special needs. Where the you know the working title of this is inclusive practices in special education, and what it really boils down to is sometimes children with special needs may spend a large portion of their day in a uh, classroom, segregated classroom, away from their peers, and uh, parents sometimes are caught in kind of in the middle of how do I, is that a right, you know, is that the correct placement or do I need to maybe challenge the school on that placement? Susan has a wealth of experience um, in the disability world uh, and I would really appreciate, first of all, Susan, let me just say thank you so much for being here. Pleasure to be here. Uh, you have, you are uh, full of knowledge and, and I rely on you and indirectly a lot of times through other people. Um, but Susan, if you would first tell us a little bit about what People First is. People First is an organization, uh, it's a statewide organization of individuals, adults with developmental disabilities, which may or may not include intellectual disabilities. Okay. Our chapter has been around over 30 years, and we're connected with a national organization called Self Advocates Becoming Empowered. Mm -hmm. And we have chapters all over the state. Some are community chapters. Most are chapters that are adjuncts with disability organizations mm -hmm. like the ARC, Volunteers of America, um, and some other agencies that provide services for people with developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. So we have a wealth of uh, leaders who have been part of People First for a long time. We just recently opened a state office. We haven't had a state office in a while, Wonderful. so it's real exciting to have a state office where uh, the staff have uh, developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. I got into the world of disabilities because my husband and I have a 31-year-old son mm -hmm. with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. He has two older sisters and a younger brother and a younger sister. So we have all adults in our families now. family now. Uh, we also have children and one great-grandchild. So oh uh, our <clears throat> road and path toward... Uh, Disability advocacy really started after he was born. He, we had a quick diagnosis of Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. So um, in the field of disabilities, that's sort of a good thing to find out at a young age that your child has some concern, right. whereas a lot of people don't get that news until they're in, you know, having problems in uh, kindergarten or first or second grade. Mm -hmm. So we had a chance to really sort of prepare what best practice would be, mm -hmm. and thinking way ahead about the other end. What kind of adult life do we want for our child? And in our case, which is not terribly unusual, my husband has a brother who had a son and ha you know, who is still around. Mm -hmm. He's 47, mm -hmm. who has Down syndrome. So they're first cousins. Yes. So. Yes we had a little bit of back background mm -hmm. uh, in our family. Mm -hmm. So you do come from this uh, from a personal perspective and I know that you have, maybe the road hasn't always been easy with schools. Um, you mentioned something uh, that I think is very important that often in the busyness of um, assisting children with disabilities or just the day-to-day -day routine of children, <laughs> of working, of some of us care for aging parents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so much going on in our lives that we don't get that opportunity to think about that big, long picture. Uh, and that is something that I see sometimes a light bulb goes off for parents when they are uh, beginning a path and you're just managing the day-to-day -day ins and outs of school, but you you know, recognize the importance of getting all the way down that road, at least in your head, a little bit. What's going to happen mm -hmm. when my child reaches adulthood? And that that big picture thinking is part of this subject that we're going to talk about today, exactly which right. is, you know, not just the day-to-day -day management of my child is attending school or my child is um, in a classroom somewhere in the school, 
but is my child in the right classroom? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this a little bit. Um, and feel free to speak from a personal perspective or perhaps stories that you know. Let me say very clearly, you know, we don't purport to give legal advice, right? Because right. every child is different and every child's circumstances are different. Schools are different. Principals are different. Um, you're dealing with people who um, we'll talk about a little bit later about our teachers and our folks who help with our children. Mm -hmm. And they really do want the best for our children. Mm -hmm. um, but in thinking in terms of, let's say I have a child who is diagnosed with a disability and I'm told during our IEP meeting that the best placement for my child is going to be in a segregated classroom um, where they spend most of their day with ch other children with disabilities and then come into the regular classroom part of the day, maybe with an aid, maybe without an aid. What, you know, parents have a lot of thoughts about that. Just if you could talk to me a little bit about what you've seen parents experience. Well, every parent really mm -hmm. wants their child to succeed to their highest capability. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times educators will say, well, your, your child will be able to get uh, more progress, academic progress in a setting where it's very small and uh, you know, focused, where there's just one teacher on three students. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they'll say that that is a better uh, opportunity for academic progress. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, mm -hmm. which started with under another name in 1972, 73, uh, has been around for a while. And there's been a lot of ex uh, experience now with children in public, ed children with significant disabilities being part of the public education. And educators that help put together that law have discovered that in actuality, uh, the academic progress is, is very important, but the big picture is how you fit into the, to the real world mm -hmm. after school, okay? Now, there's been a wealth of experience with adults leaving institutions. Like, we have, Alabama no longer has any public institutions. Right. We're a leader in that uh, regard around the country. So you have to think, if my child has spent from pre-K, kindergarten, all the way through their 21st year, which if you have a disability, you have access to that long mm -hmm. of services. If they've spent all of those years in isolated settings, they might have some very decent uh, academic skills, but they don't have any knowledge of how to network, how to react, how to problem solve the way they would if they had been in more inclusive settings. Our children tend to learn so much incidentally mm -hmm. just by rubbing elbows, by being in the same environment, by learning how to uh, watch what others do and know that, oh, I'll just follow along here, mm -hmm. just like we do, right? When we're in situations <clears throat> where we're a little bit over our head, right. we do the same thing. We say, well, I think I'll wait a minute to you know, see what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And that's what all kids need to have access to those opportunities. And I'm talking all children, mm -hmm. uh, children with the most limited physical, intellectual, medical, they all benefit from maximizing interaction in typical settings. Right. Oh, gosh, that is so much to think about. That's a wonderful um, segue into our next segment, which um, we've, I've heard you say, you know, this is very important for children with whatever disabilities to be educated and, and socializing and uh, problem solving with other children. So. In the next segment, we're going to talk about how do parents who have had their children placed in a segregated environment, or, or maybe the school's recommending that placement, how do you go about negotiating with the school to say, uh, you know, we're not experts. Um, we are experts on our own children, but 
you're going to give us some of those language skills. So if you would, um, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Get Connected uh, on the Alabama Way. Uh, my name is Tricia Crane. I am talking today with Susan Ellis, who is State Coordinator for People First, which is an organization for adults uh, with developmental disabilities. Susan is talking with us today about inclusive practices in special education, which is kind of a tricky thing for a lot of parents. Um, parents have a tendency to um, just go with what school officials suggest in terms of will your child be placed in a segregated classroom or where will your child be placed. And school officials typically have their reasons for wanting these types of placements, but we as parents um, pretty much intrinsically know if this is a good idea or not. In our last segment, Susan, you were talking a bit about how a segregated classroom, while it might improve maybe an academic um, record, uh, you know, more intense work one-on-one, -on -one, that a lot of what some folks refer to as soft skills, right? We hear That's the right. business community talk about soft skills. It's difficult to develop those soft skills in a segregated or protected environment. Mm -hmm. So right before we broke, we were going to talk about um, how do parents, you know, I'll say my child um, has Down syndrome, and school officials tell me that, you know, it's going to be best for your child to be placed in a segregated environment most of the day. And we know this because, and they give me a list of reasons. And I, as a parent, am not an expert on education, but, you know, typically parents get that little nagging feeling and they think, gosh, is this really the best placement for my child? But it can be difficult to ask those questions in a respectful yet purposeful mm -hmm. way to sort of challenge the school district to say, maybe it could be different. Can you help, help parents um, with some of the language that maybe we could use to mm -hmm. negotiate that experience? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the common things you can really remind educators that special education is a service not a place. Okay. So thinking of your child as, you know, very individually, uh, not necessarily looking for the right program, mm -hmm. but looking for the services that are, are right for your child. Even kids with Down syndrome mm -hmm. vary tremendously from right. one to another. Right. So not getting bogged down into, you know, the experiences for what's right for one child is not necessarily going to be right for all children. Right. So that, you know, really respecting the I and individual and giving educators, creating a good team and always talking about the team. Mm -hmm. Never say, I want, it's my child needs. Very good. And, mm -hmm. and saying, you know, we can do this if you see a falter you can say, we let our child down, mm -hmm. not just blaming the educators, right. Very uh, trying to stay one step ahead, and really reminding yourself that it's the end product and thinking, even if your child is only five or six years old, you've got to say, you know, how are these school experiences going to affect my child when they exit and have a job right. and are living on their own, there's a concept uh, in the disability field called building social capital. Okay. And that would be, I don't know if you have any friends that you knew when you were in kindergarten and grew up with. I but do. But <laughs> those are part of your personal social capital. Mm -hmm. They're people that you can probably still call on that network. Uh, so we want our kids need it even more, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So our kids need to be able to know that, well, yeah, I was in the fourth grade with Sam, and now he owns the store down the street. So that might be somebody I could work with exactly. who really knows me because I was in the fourth grade class. Our, mm -hmm. our son did that. When he got his first job, and it's his current job, when he was 17, he works at Chuck E. Cheese in our n neighborhood, yeah. and uh, this is the year, the summer before he was going to be a senior. Mm -hmm. uh, the general manager was all for it, mm -hmm. and 
the general manager was able to talk to some of our son's classmates who also had jobs there and say, well, you know, Matthew, mm-hmm. you know, what do you think he would be good at? Mm-hmm. So that's building social capital. If Matthew hadn't been in the same classes as those kids, even though he right. wasn't meeting the same standard, right, right, which is a whole other discussion. Oh, right. Uh, right. You know, some of our kids, it's okay not to meet the same standard in the regular setting. Some of our kids who, all of our kids need to aspire to the highest possible achievement. Absolutely. So many of our kids who don't have as significant an intellectual disability need a lot of support to meet the regular standards, and that's important too, and that's a whole other discussion on how you get that done. But I'm talking about kids with the most significant disabilities can learn, meet their individualized goals mm-hmm. in maybe unexpected places. Looking at your school as a microcosm of your community mm-hmm. so that when the appropriate academic goals cannot be taught or learned well for that child, their learning style isn't such that they'll benefit from being in that regular setting, you can look at other places in the school campus where either with a peer or an adult, the learning is appropriate. Uh, Well, and and let mm -hmm. me say, we talked a little bit during the break about that, let's say math skills are, are, um, your child is struggling with math skills. Maybe the best place to learn the math skills might not be in the regular classroom, but it might not be over in that segregated classroom either. It might be working with the yearbook committee, right? right? To count money to to help with those spreadsheets you know that that, that those kids use now right to there's uh, all kinds of track fun of activities things. A, a, even a fairly young child might want to take a survey of the students in the classroom mm-hmm. about who's going to win the super bowl or who's going to so you're talking about uh, writing names so you're mm-hmm. you know learning a little reading you're making a graph about you know who thinks what, you're adding up how many students, you're working on percentages, but it's all, our kids have a hard time usually with significant intellect transferring skills, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. instead of learning the concept, which is very abstract, doing the actual helps them learn the skill better. Oh, absolutely. So working with literally with a budget right? uh, instead of, you know, some kind of, paper and pencil skills that might lead toward a budget. And all of that sounds great, right? But sometimes parents have difficulty impressing upon the teachers or the school officials who may say, gosh, we have 92 children in the Mm -hmm. seventh grade, uh, or we have, you know, your teacher is in charge of 24 children every day. That's where that whole individualized education plan, individualized service, of um, trying to find out what your child needs, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not a program, right? We're we're looking for what your child needs to succeed. And that's where I think parents fear that um, over in a segregated classroom, my child might be forgotten, right? Uh, That's a natural fear. I've talked with a lot of parents who have had that fear. And Yet again, it's still difficult to bring those, sometimes it's difficult to bring teachers and school officials along to say, I do believe that my child needs to spend more time with their typical peers. And I think it's important, and I I know you would likely back me up on this, parents don't have to know everything, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Parents can ask questions that that need answering and sometimes school officials might not have the answers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are other people in other agencies, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe your physician, some of those folks who can help you work with school officials to find the best placement and the best setting for your child in which your child can learn. And when we come back, we're going to take another break, but when we come back, um, I want to talk a little bit about maybe where, where parents can find those resources and working with teachers, um, how to really uh, develop those relationships so that you're all championing the same effort, which is what's best for your child. So we'll be right back with Susan Ellis. Thank you. 
Welcome back. Uh, this is Get Connected. My name is Tricia Crane. I'm talking with Susan Ellis, the State Coordinator for People First. Susan has been filling us with lots of great information about how to advocate for our children who, and we're, and we're really talking about children with significant disabilities um, who may be have been placed in a segregated classroom or maybe uh, during the course of the day spends most of their time outside of what we call the general classroom. And uh, in our last segment we talked a little bit about advocating about how parents, what kind of questions parents can ask um, and you know ask a lot of them, right? Uh, but what we're really questioning is what is the least restrictive environment in which our children can learn. And you'll see it uh, designated with the acronym LRE, right? Mm -hmm. and the special education world loves acronyms. It's on your IEP form. It is. Mm -hmm. It's on your IEP, your individualized education plan form. But it's something that every, every time you have an IEP meeting, you talk about the least restrictive environment. And typically, it's school officials who make that determination. And then if you as a parent disagree with that, you have to ask some questions. And sometimes those negotiations can be a little tough. Mm -hmm. um, parents sometimes are uh, not as knowledgeable about what's happening within classrooms, so it kind of keeps parents quiet. But I think you would say ask questions and ask a lot of them. One of the things that we discussed was this idea of thinking outside the box, right? So if you would, talk, talk a little bit about how parents can talk about thinking out of the box with educators and how placement can change during a year. Well, giving yourself confidence that you may not know the law, you may not be an educator, but you know your child. Right. So, and this is true in a lot of different things, not just education, but really families need to follow their gut. So mm -hmm. if their gut is telling them something or an experience with an older sibling where they already know the school and they know some of the opportunities that their child might be missing, mm -hmm. you can start there. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing too that, the, that actually the law is not neutral on setting. The law is really biased in, in favor of inclusion because it actually says that, where, that if your child can make reasonably benefit from the regular setting, Mm -hmm. Not maximum, but reasonable benefit. Because again, the law recognizes that our kids are going to learn so many life skills right. incidentally that aren't written intentionally into the IEP. That's why that typical setting is really the preferential. And that the law says that that least restrictive environment should be the first placement. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have to win your way out of the segregated into the regular. You should mm -hmm. give it your best effort with appropriate aids and supports, okay. which is going to be different for every kid. Give it your best shot, and then you can figure out what other environments mm -hmm. are more appropriate. And again, not necessarily a resource room or a, a segregated classroom. Right. You can be very individualized. And I think it's great because most educators and administrators, you know, they're not evil people. They want they went into the field because they love children right. and they want people to grow. They just may not have been exposed to really thinking in different terms, thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, give permission to experiment and be flexible. Try to be knowledgeable about the culture of the school, even if you haven't had an older child go to that school or some neighbor. Uh, I always say, look at your yearbook. Even the mm. elementary schools have yearbooks where you can see what are all the po potential settings where your child might thrive. That's so, a great resource, the right. yearbook. Mm -hmm. So, and then always include somebody we were talking about how if, if you really feel intimidated to have that discussion with your team, and remember, even the placement is a team decision, and know that you're the most important person on that team next to your child. Mm -hmm. Even at a young age, your child should start being part of that team, and there's a whole concept of how to get seven and eight-year-olds to participate 
to get wow. children who have the most significant communication delays. There's use, ways to use technology to get them to participate because then that gets the team used to thinking in terms of that individual student instead of the wow. diagnosis. Wow, that is, that's very innovative. You know, you don't really hear of that happening a lot. It's critical. Um, but and that's gonna, what we're talking about. It's going to start happening more. Right. And we were talking about there are agencies. There's the Alabama Disability Advocacy Program mm -hmm. that's out of the university in Tuscaloosa mm -hmm. that you can contact if you want more information. There's lots of resources. COSEPTA does a lot of, and I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with oh, yes. the community special education. It's community outreach, special okay. education, PTA. So mm -hmm. places... Uh, where there's advocates, where you can go to workshops, and they're mostly free. Uh, the Alabama Parent Education Center has excellent workshops. Some are webinars online. Uh, if if you have an interest for more, they're well. People are welcome to call me, and I'll help them access some resources, disability rights, and resources in the Greater excellent. Birmingham area. Um, so, I, so what I'm hearing you say is there are a lot of people out here in our community that will help parents who are maybe a little bit intimidated by school officials or maybe just need um, people who are maybe medical experts even mm -hmm. on their child's condition, Absolutely. right, or disability, a, a special need. And so when you bring all those people together at the IEP meeting, mm -hmm. um, you talk about least restrictive environment. And what you're saying, and what I really like about what you're saying is start, start with that pie in the sky, right? As much time as possible uh, in the regular classroom as opposed to the segregated classroom. And your, your words about you shouldn't have to win your way out of a segregated classroom. I hope that parents can really grab onto that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I do think that this is all incredible advice, uh, incredible uh, help for parents. One of the things that I, I uh, no other way to say it than, you know, crafting great relationships, mm -hmm. right? Some, this is emotional. This is emotional stuff for parents. These are our children, and we are dependent upon school officials to, and teachers. You know, our children are in their classrooms from 8 to 3 every day depending upon where you are, right? And so there's a great deal of trust that we place in our school officials. Keeping those lines of communication open. Don't wait until something terrible happens. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, like you said, trust your gut. Mm -hmm. If you're feeling that maybe this is not the right placement for my child, maybe my child is um, coming home and telling me that he colored on a, uh, you know, a color book about Christopher Columbus all day or something. If you begin, or watched a Hollywood movie, right? Or watched a, the Hollywood movie, you know this kind of stuff. You you need to ask questions. Um, I think school officials would appreciate your mm -hmm. involvement, and your engagement, and your child's education. And and I understand because I lived that life. This is your community, and you have probably have other children, mm -hmm. so you don't want to walk into your school and have all the administrators and educators, you know, try to stay away. I mean, you're going to see them at the ballpark and in the grocery store. Exactly. You want to be part of the community. So again, making sure that they know they're not the only ones. You're there to help them and shore them up and give them some direction. Our school system cooperated. They sent some of their educators to national conferences wow. to, to explore some of these ideas mm -hmm. uh, to give them the skills that they need to, you know, to do these kind of innovative things. And now, if you think about it, our son started kindergarten in 1989, graduated uh, in 2001, mm -hmm. never was in the resource room or a segregated classroom. The service came to him. So there are good uh, examples of success. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. That is, that, and that I think that's what makes you such an effective advocate. Is that it's a proactive. Mm -hmm. um, always have to sort of stay on top of it uh, in conjunction working with your school officials. 
I can't thank you enough. Susan, we have so many topics we could talk about, and I hope to have you back, and we can explore more of those topics. Glad to. Thank you. Thank you for being here, and thank you for um, watching us uh, and, and listening in on this conversation. There will be information. Um, uh, People First is on the web, and we will provide more information on how to get in touch with Susan. Thank you for watching.